in many rural areas of the American West, cutting firewood in national forests is a necessary chore if you want a warm house through the winter. Our home in mountainous central Idaho was no exception. It was normal for my dad to pick my brothers and I up after school and head up into the mountains for an afternoon of firewood gathering. My dad would fell the dead trees, then saw them into chunks. My brothers and I had the task of rolling the wood to the truck and loading it. We would continue this assembly line process until we had a truckload of wood, usually before nightfall. Hot, sweaty, and exhausted, we would pile into the truck cab and make our way down the mountain. At home the next day, we would unload and split the wood and stack it into neat little rows. This process was repeated until we had a winter's worth of fuel for our house, our grandma's cabin, and any extra for elderly neighbors. This particular afternoon, we decided to try a different logging road on the other side of the valley. This was well outside our family logging area. No real reason for the change, but my dad said he wanted a change of scenery. This logging road hadn't been maintenanced in some time. Large rocks and fallen branches littered the path. My brothers and I had to walk out in front, pushing rocks and wood out of the way as my dad lurched the truck up the switchbacks. Yard by yard, we slowly made our way up the mountain. The hike was physically brutal. As we ascended the mountain and got farther into the trees, this odd feeling started to set in. I wasn't sure if it was the exhaustion from the hike or something more. There was electricity in the air, like the whole mountain was buzzing at a wavelength just below my senses. In some odd way, it felt like the mountain knew we were there, and it wasn't welcome to that fact. I wanted to say something to my brothers, but before I opened my mouth, my younger brother said, Does anyone else feel like we're not welcome here? My older brother and I stopped in our tracks and looked back at him. Both of us nodded in agreement. This moment was broken by my dad honking and motioning us to continue clearing the path. Reluctantly, we pushed forward to a small clearing in the woods where we finally stopped the truck. My dad, oblivious to our apprehension, or simply choosing to ignore it, grabbed his saw and went to work. As the wood was felled and loaded, I couldn't shake this feeling enveloping me like a dark shroud. I noticed my brothers were taking occasional glances over their shoulders as we worked. Everyone but my dad, it seemed, was on edge. The sun nestled down into the trees, and twilight began to set in. As the light drained from the sky, my anxiety only intensified. It wasn't until my dad unexpectedly told us to load up that a wave of relief flooded over me. I could see the tension in my brothers melt away as well. The truck wasn't fully loaded, an oddity. Getting a half load was a waste, according to my dad. We would sometimes work into the dark just to make sure the truck was full. But tonight, he seemed eager to head home. With everything loaded, we started down the road. Although dead tired, everyone seemed to be in a much lighter mood. We were chatting and cracking jokes while trying to blow off steam from the afternoon. We were almost out of the tree line and into the valley desert. Going down the switchbacks, you want to be careful, especially with a load. Even if it was half that, a brown blur jumped up from the downslope of the switchback. Shit was the only word that came out of my dad's mouth as he slammed on the brakes. Loaded with wood and traveling downhill, there was no way to avoid smashing into the blur. The truck finally ground to a standstill. The four of us peered through the windshield, nobody saying a word. Illuminated in the yellow glow of the headlights was a crumpled body of a deer. Grumbling and cursing the deer's existence, my dad exited the truck to investigate. Doing as they were told, my brother stayed put in the truck. I didn't listen, following close behind my dad. The truck was fine. We hadn't been traveling fast when we smacked the deer. Just some hair and blood in the grill guard. Hitting a deer really wasn't that unusual. The mountains were full of them. What was unusual was that the deer dropped so quickly. 
At faster speeds, deer could still be upright and sprinting away to die in the woods after a collision. That last burst of adrenaline dump. This one fell over like a rag doll. Before even approaching the carcass, a deep, foul smell hit us. Deer smell bad when they're alive, but this was on a whole other level. It was the smell of decay and rot. My stomach began to turn as we got closer. My nostrils were burning. Coming up on the deer, it was clearly dead. Really, really dead. The stench was so overwhelming, my eyes were watering. The body was a true horror scene. The deer's eyes were gone, replaced with a sunken, hollow hole, as if to overcompensate for their absence. The tongue was swollen and black as coal. It could not be contained and hung out the side of its mouth. The underbelly was split open, entrails and offal spilled into the dirt. In the dim headlights, it looked as though as the deer's fur and viscera were moving, wiggling almost. Holding my breath, I bent down for a closer look, and my heart stopped. The deer, inside and out, was covered in maggots. It was dead all right, but our truck didn't kill it. Clearly, it had been dead for days, if not weeks. I backed away, retching. That electric anxiety came screaming back. My dad was always the quiet, stoic type, but right now, even in the dim headlights of the truck, I could see the abject horror in his face. His gaze wasn't on the deer, but focused down the mountain. Poorly masking the fear in his voice, he told me firmly to walk back to the truck and get inside. I obeyed without objection. As I grabbed the door handle, a loud shriek came out of the trees. Branches were shattering and breaking. Something was heading up the slope towards us. I slammed my door just as my dad reached the truck. Before his door was shut, he pressed on the accelerator. The truck launched forward, sending us over the deer carcass and racing downhill. With mine and my brothers yelling, it was hard to tell that the shrieking was following us. Our truck popped out of the tree line and into the desert sagebrush. Once out of the woods, everything quietened down. We were left with only the rumble of the engine and wind through the half-open windows. Pulling into our property, the truck came to a stop. We sat in silence. No one moved to leave the truck. Everyone started talking at once. We all had questions. What was that screaming? How does a dead deer jump uphill in front of a truck? There was no way the truck killed it. My dad just shook his head and motioned for us to quiet down. That deer was dead when we hit it. It didn't jump out in front of us. It was thrown at us. We stared at him. He explained that all day up on the mountain, he had felt uneasy. Not wanting to worry us boys, he kept it to himself. He described it like walking into a stranger's living room while they were upstairs asleep. That feeling never left him. And as twilight came, he happened to catch a shadow in the corner of his eye, not far into the woods, and saw figures moving from tree to tree. He couldn't focus on them long enough for a good look before they dodged behind the trees. His stomach dropped. Working hard to keep his composure, he hurried us to the truck to leave. It was after hitting the deer and discovering it was long dead that my dad pieced together what was happening. Something threw that deer to get us to stop. Before the shrieking began, he could hear something moving in the darkness beyond the road. It was a trap. Running back to the truck could have started an ambush or trigger a prey drive, so we walked back to the truck. The second we were inside, he drove that truck downhill with no intention of stopping for anyone or anything. That feeling of electricity didn't disappear until we hit the county highway. My brothers and I never saw anything as we drove away, but those screams from the forest will never leave my mind. We didn't gather firewood the rest of the season. For the first time in his life, my dad just bought what we needed, and although we started to gather wood again the next season, 
We've never been back up to that particular mountain. The Forest Service has permanently closed and reclaimed that road. The only way back up into those woods is a long hike, one I'm not interested in ever taking. Whatever was on that mountain, whatever threw that deer carcass, whatever chased us out of the woods, it did not want us there. It wanted us gone. Or worse, it wanted us dead. I have a story to share that has really traumatized me for quite a while now, and I feel this is a good place to share. For context, it's important that I state that I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We do have the odd missing person or scary case, but it's otherwise safe here, and not much happens. I mean that in a way that as a 19-year-old girl, I feel comfortable to walk the streets at night or go on hikes alone because it's pretty safe and everyone looks out for one another, generally. This happened in the summer of 2019. My boyfriend and I were headed out on a picnic date spot we'd visited before plenty of times, Karakariki Track. It's at the end of a very long, windy rural farm road off the state highway, so you drive like 15 to 20 minutes from the main road down a long farm stretch, and at the end is a large cul-de-sac and surrounding massive farm. The owners of the farm had left the land kind of open to the public as a reserve because there are native trees and other things, and because about a 15 minute walk from the cul-de-sac slash car park, there's a small waterfall you can swim in. The track is really popular as it's one of the closest swimming spots to the nearest city, and it's really scenic. You cross footbridges and pass by creek beds and that kind of thing. The farmers still go through every now and then and do their farm work, and there are fenced off areas that the public can't enter as they still actively work the land. This particular day, my boyfriend and I were happy because it was empty in the parking lot and it was a really hot summer day, so that was really rare. The farmer was crossing the cows through the gate on a quad as we arrived, and he smiled and waved at us. He's an older man and we'd spoken before as we were regular visitors, so we set off towards the waterfall. We crossed one footbridge and passed through a big paddock of cows. The track is quite narrow and the creek is right off the edges, so you have to be careful. We saw the waterfall, decided against swimming as we had no towels, and headed back towards the car park. Now on our way back, we decided to go down a little bit of a steep gravel off-ramp on the track that led to a more private tree-covered area right by the creek. Here's where it starts. We were kissing and whatnot. I was laying on my stomach reading a book, and my boyfriend was sitting up playing on his phone, and he was rubbing my back and playing with my hair. We were there for about ten minutes before I turned and glanced up the gravel path, and way up even further on a hill through one of the farmer's gates, I saw a big man on a quad bike who I didn't recognize as one of the farmers, as there's only an old couple who work the land. He was just sitting there, staring at my boyfriend and I, and I don't even want to think about how long he'd been there before we noticed. I told my boyfriend, and as soon as the guy saw we were both looking at him, he opened the gate and started heading down. Now both of us immediately got up to leave, as we did not want to have a conversation with the farmer about us getting freaky on his land, which is what we both assumed would happen, but it was so much worse. This guy came down the gravel track and ran his quad right through the creek. He left it there running in the water and got off. He was talking to himself, saying things along the lines of, Ah oh, fuck, I've messed up my quad, I've fucked my engine over and over before he even got near us. My boyfriend and I were gathering our things to leave at this point, and he starts to head toward us. He didn't even make small talk, which was really strange, because he went straight into saying, Have you guys seen any fish? I'm looking for some fish to kill. My boyfriend tells the guy there's no fish in the creek as it's fresh water, and he's probably best off to catch some eel and this sends him into a fit, and he starts saying, I don't want no fucking eel, 
I want to kill some fish. I'd made it a point to not look the guy in the eyes as I didn't want to draw the conversation towards myself because I was already extremely freaked out and I didn't want him to notice that. My boyfriend is much more of the calm and strong one when it comes to stuff like this, but for a second I did look at the guy and I thought he looked like his face was slightly deformed, possibly Bell's palsy as I work in aged care and I've seen it a bit and it looked similar. I bent down to tie my shoe up, and when I was standing back up, that's when I saw a pistol on the man's waist. Listen to me close now. This is the first and last time in my entire life I've ever seen a real-life gun. It's incredibly hard to get a firearm in New Zealand, especially after the regulations following the mass shooting in Christchurch. And not only that, he had one pistol on his belt and was waving another one about in his hand while he talked to my boyfriend about wanting to kill some fish. He was aiming it down to the creek every now and again, and then swinging it around his finger. My boyfriend gave me this stern look, and stern is the best word for it, because the look spoke a million things to me in that moment, and he nodded his head towards the gravel hill leading back to the track. I grabbed the two bags we had, fake checked my phone and told the man that our family were waiting for us back at the car park. He completely ignored what I had said and instead said, that's a cool hat you got on, or something about my hat that was completely irrelevant. So I dismissed myself and said goodbye and made my way to the hill. In my mind, I did not want to look back and see my boyfriend be shot and then a gun at my head. I knew our best bet was getting up this hill onto the narrow path he couldn't ride his quad down and sprinting to the farmer's house. As I'm walking up the hill, this guy says to my boyfriend, that's a real pretty girl you got there. And it was like all the intentions of his I didn't want to believe were confirmed. I felt like I would die. My boyfriend though said a quick thank you, we'll be off now, and headed up the hill with me. The guy kept talking on like the conversation hadn't ended, even as we headed away and he stood there, gun in hand, watching us leave. As soon as we were around the corner, we sprinted all the way back to the car park, where there were ten empty bullet cases. We had run into two girls in bikinis just arriving at the spot as we did, and we informed them about everything. They got into their cars and left immediately. We tried to go to the farmer's house to ask if he knew the guy as we'd never seen him on the land before, but they were not home anymore. As for the gun, it's still so freaky to me as I'd never seen one before. But these pistols look quite old and rusty, and when we discussed the incident on the way home, my boyfriend suggested they were probably handed down to him from someone else. This incident had stuck with me for the past few years, and my boyfriend and I have not been able to return to the spot, which sucks because that's where we had our first date, and it was a really sentimental place for us. I had to drive past the road leading to the track for like a year as I commuted between towns, and it always made me feel sick. I could have lost my life or my partner that day, or so much worse, and I'm always extremely grateful that my boyfriend is the man he is, and was able to steer the guy away from us for us to leave, and to communicate to me through movement to tell me what to do in my freaked out state. He told me after that he was ready to die if he had to, because knowing the guy had been watching us beforehand and complimenting me in the way he did, it was clear that he could have had some scary intentions. It's also made me way more fearful now to travel in the bush alone, which I've done my whole life. Rural Northeast Ohio, an hour and a half southeast of Cleveland. Back in 2020, my wife and I really got into fishing after a small, off-the-grid type vacation. We decided to keep the good vibes going when we returned home by making plans to fish the following week. We decided to head out near where my parents live because there was a large lake that everyone fished at, but I also knew of a small lake just up the way that only a few people knew of. When we arrived at the large well-known spot, it was packed. We tried to find a place to cast in, 
but after searching for about 20 minutes, I packed up and we just went to the hidden gem up the road. When we arrived, no one was there, and we gave each other a high five and started finding a place to set up. My wife went about a quarter mile away from me and we began casting in. The pond is surrounded by about three miles of wood on each side and was nice and peaceful, or so I thought. About 15 minutes into it, my wife waves me over with a scared look on her face. Thinking she's probably hooked something she couldn't pull in, I started jogging down to her. When I arrived, she looked me in the eyes and said, There's a baby crying in the woods and someone's yelling at it. I started to laugh and explain we were the only ones here, but she insisted. We packed up our things as we both felt a bit uncomfortable and we were just going to call it a day and get out of there but some weird curiosity took over both of us, and after loading up the car, we both walked into the woods to see if we could find anything. About 20 feet in, we saw a baby shoe, then a few more feet, children's clothes, then a whole camp set up with wet children's clothes everywhere, soaking wet. Toys, socks, shoes, then piles of human waste and adult male clothing. We looked at each other and turned to leave when we heard some crazy movement coming from behind us. We turned around and saw something running through the woods to the right of us. We both just took off running as fast as we could. We jumped back into the car and I drove straight to my parents' house. They only live four miles from this spot at most. I ran into the house and explained everything to my dad what happened, and he told me I could call the state trooper, who was the only sort of authority in the area, so I did. They just told me they would check it out. Nothing ever came of it. I have no idea if they believed me or not. I never really thought about this again until this past weekend. I visited my parents again for some holiday cookout. My grandparents now live on the same property after some health complications. Right when I was leaving at about 10pm, my grandpa looked me right in the eye and said, Drive safe. There are people in the woods. I asked him what he meant but he does have dementia coming on, so I was worried this was a flare-up. He then went on to say a few more sentences about people traveling with children through the woods. I can't stop thinking about it. When I was a kid, I used to spend my summers in my grandparents' summer home, which was located precisely in the middle of Mountainville, nowhere. Like, there's not even gravel road access to the house. You gotta trek through some pretty dense bush on a pretty steep incline in order to get there. Because I was a kid, one who had no inkling of what internet was, I loved everything about it. Endless exploration, rock climbing, and other danger-seeking opportunities. I convinced my grandfather to build me and my cousin a treehouse, eating the best food known to man, swapping scary stories by a campfire. Everything was awesome. Everything. Except that one time I came across a random well in the middle of the woods. Now, wells in and of themselves can be pretty creepy, but I think this one takes the cake. It looked like something that belonged in a medieval fantasy horror story. It had this really tall, pointy thatched roof, a base of grey, mossy, misaligned stones, and even had a wooden bucket, which didn't strike me as weird at the time, but looking back, the bucket was spiffy clean. It was made of this nice, glossy wood that wasn't chipped or marred in any way. Really, it looked brand new, so that was weird. I remember stumbling upon this well, and instead of being absolutely thrilled to explore it, like my reckless, curious child self would have been, I felt sick, like physically nauseous. I couldn't stand to look at the thing without feeling gross. I had zero desire to go near it. I did go near it because curiosity won out in the end, and I wanted to have a story to tell my cousin, so I went up to it and looked down. Man, I kid you not, this thing had stairs in it shiny, wooden spiral stairs leading down to who knows where. For some reason, 
they scared the piss out of me and I hightailed it out of there real quick. I never told my cousin because I know he would have wanted to go and find it and climb down and the idea of doing that honestly made me feel like crawling out of my skin. It still does, just thinking about it. Anyway, the real scary part about it is that this random ass well started popping up and still does pop up in my dreams from time to time. Like, it just appears in the middle of whatever dream I'm having. To this day, and I'm an adult now, it still scares the life out of me. To be honest, I don't believe in the supernatural, but I don't think I'll ever be able to overcome this instinctual fear to go down this well, in dream or otherwise. I was driving through eastern Washington on some state roads. There were no rest stops or cities, but I'd done the route enough to know that there were these massive dirt areas every 40 miles where you could park safely away from the road. I decided to call it a night and closed my blinds and laid down to watch something on my phone. After roughly an hour, I hear someone try to open the driver's side door. I haven't heard any vehicles on the road the whole time I parked but I get up to have a peek out of the curtains. As I'm looking out into the blackness of the driver's side window, I hear them try the passenger side door. I peek down from the top of the curtain but can't see anything, so I start the truck and kick on the lights. I'm fairly freaked out at this point, so I'm still not opening the curtains but peeking through the gaps. Nothing, nobody is standing near either of my doors or parked within sight lines. I take a deep breath and close the sleeper curtains too, because for some reason, that's gonna make things better, right? After laying back down and convincing myself that something blew against the truck, and it only sounded like the doors, I hear what sounds like someone trying to pry open the vents on the sleeper. The door handles start clicking again, and the truck starts shifting like someone's climbing on it. I hit the little alarm button in the sleeper, hoping to spook them off but it does nothing but add to the noise of the door handles, fingers tapping and the hiss of air coming out of the suspension. And suddenly it stops. A few moments where I can only hear myself breathing and my heart pounding before I hear another truck approach and then drive by. I spent the next few hours waiting for whatever it was to come back, but it never did. In the morning, I couldn't find any footprints or damage to my truck, but on every window were tiny, human-looking handprints, like a toddler had licked their hand and stuck it to my window over and over. My father and I were taking a quick hike just a few miles north of Butte, Montana. It's not absolute wilderness that far outside of Butte, but just a few miles outside. Most towns in Montana means you're way out in the backwoods. It wasn't an unusual day by any means, a warm June afternoon, perfect for a little hike. We were only a mile or so from where we parked when we saw a large trash bag along the trail. I hate litter bugs, especially out in the woods. I intended to haul it back with us and dispose of it properly. When I attempted to lift the bag though, it was heavy, much heavier than I'd anticipated. Curiosity got the better of me and my father, and we split the bag open to see what was inside. I was expecting a dead animal of some sort. It's not totally unusual for someone to dispose of a dead dog or cat in this fashion in this part of the world. Some people out here will poach deer and leave the trimmings like this too. Upon opening the bag, we saw a boot, and then socks, and then pants. We then realized they were attached to human legs. It looked so unreal, like a movie prop, like someone took a saw and cut off a store dummy's legs at the groin. This had to be some sort of a prank, right? It wasn't. I fell backwards and started having a panic attack. Nothing prepares you for something like that. My dad, on the other hand, sprung into action. 
He immediately closed the bag back up as best as he could, and it started to slowly survey our surroundings. That freaked me out even more. Through my gasps, I asked him what he was looking for. All he said was, there might be someone watching us. Can you imagine stumbling upon a serial killer's dump site, and they're at a distance watching you? That really didn't help my panic. As I tried to calm down, my dad called the Silver Bow County Sheriff and reported what we'd found. Limp-legged, we hiked the mile or so to the road and waited for the cops to show up. The authorities searched the area with cadaver dogs for a week and never found any other pieces of the body, or even a scent trail to follow. The sheriff's people even searched our truck and interviewed us to see if we might be responsible. Nothing ever came of the whole incident, not one single thing. It's been just over ten years, and nobody has any idea who the Lex belonged to or how they got there. No missing persons report that matched up, and DNA from the Lex never showed up on any databases. Butte, Montana has a reputation for being a bit of a rough side, so it's not impossible the guy was a local who ran into trouble. But why wouldn't his family or friends report him missing? Surely someone would have noticed he was gone or at the very least, legless. I don't think we'll ever know the truth, but someone out there knows what happened, and they aren't too eager to give us the whole story. This was a story when I was younger and braver, and kinda did stupid stuff without thinking. This story is a wild ride, and it's all true. I used to work at a pizza shop down the street from 2pm until they closed. I usually didn't get off until 11 or so at night. I had a car, but was close enough to walk, so I did that most days to save gas. This particular night, I was doing my usual thing, jamming to one of my playlists, tired, but happy to have a good job, and just generally happy with the way my life was going. Up ahead, about a block from my place, I see an attractive guy in dark clothing walking, but not with a purpose really. He was taller than me, maybe 5 foot 10 or 6 foot or so, and he had shaggy brown hair. The closer I got to him, the more I could tell he was really good looking. Like, even in the dark of night, I was starting to get excited. His features kind of escaped me now, but I do remember he had very thick eyebrows. I took one earbud out, and because I'm from a dangerous city and haven't really cared about stranger danger, I decided to talk to him, maybe even flirt a bit. How's your late night going? It's good. Just looking to get drunk, he says. Oh, that I can help with. I've got a mini bar in my place. I live just down the street. That was, not verbatim, how the conversation went. During the walk back to my place, I got no red flags from this guy. He seemed totally normal, and I was honestly thinking, Wow, just through sheer luck, I met a really handsome guy, and he seems cool and fun. I was beside myself, really. So, we get to my apartment on the second floor. I jump into host mode and offer him to have a seat and make himself comfortable. The apartment is about 640 square feet, so it's very small. Except for the bathroom. You can't see the rest of the apartment from any area. I head into the kitchen, and while I'm pouring drinks, I glance back over at him. It was then that I noticed the first red flag. As I was asking him questions, he's more delayed with his answers. Especially more so than he just was on our walk there. It was just odd to me. I go back over to the couch, pass him his drink and sit down next to him. So what do you do for work? I asked. Oh, I'm not here for sex. He puts his drink down on the table. What do you mean? I'm not after sex either, I respond. He stands up. What do you got? He asks me. His nice vernacular and friendly face are now gone. I'm having a hard time processing what he means by this. I said, what do you got? The second I stand up, he pushes me back. I fly across the room, hitting the floor, but not hard enough to pass out or anything. I get right back up, 
but he's already grabbed my laptop and my work bag. As I start towards him, he cuts around me and makes his way towards the front door. I'm right behind him when he makes it outside. I manage to grab a hold of him, and we tussle again in front of the door. Now I shout out, calling on help from the neighbors. It's late at night, so no one comes. I'm shouting, Please help, I'm being robbed. The thing is, he has my laptop. It's not just any laptop. I hate to admit it, but my entire life was on that laptop at the time. Important photos that I'd not backed up. Thousands of dollars of music programs, video game programming stuff for a development team I helped. Really expensive software and other stuff. It was, in my mind, irreplaceable. I give chase down the stairs, across the dog walk park, and as I start to gain on him, we tussle again and the only thing I can focus on is my laptop. I knew that I had to, at any cost, get my laptop back. That was absolutely all I cared about. Somehow I get a grip on my laptop, I tug at it again, and I guess he decides I'm not worth all of this struggle. He gets up and starts to take off again. I now realize he still has my work bag. It has my cell phone and wallet in it. I take off towards him again, and this time, he shouts back at me, Follow me, and I'll stab you again. This makes me stop in my tracks, and he gets away, underneath a street lamp along the sidewalk. I immediately inspect myself. Was I stabbed? No way, there's no way. Then I see blood running down my leg. I see blood on my arm. Two places where he cut me good. I'm scared, but the blood makes it look worse than it is. I decide that's enough. I got my laptop, and that's all I really wanted anyway. I hobble back home and get inside and lock my door. I called the police using my neighbor's phone the next day and filed a police report, explaining the situation, showing the stab wounds and declining medical service. I can't afford that, and I was fine all things considered. So, all that guy got was a shitty cell phone and a wallet with like 30 to 40 dollars in it. The cop called my friend back several days later and said they were not able to find the guy and that he would keep me posted. This was years ago, so I don't know where the robber is now, but I have every electronic thing of importance backed up on multiple drives. This happened about a year ago. I was living in Barrio Logan in San Diego at the time. My place was the side entrance of a duplex, and the house was right next to a park. One night at around 11pm, I was playing Call of Duty. I had my front door open and the screen door locked to help cool down the house. As I was playing with my friends, I heard screaming outside but thought it was just my game. I then heard it again, followed by a female scream. My friends over my headset pointed it out and asked me what was going on in my house. I replied to them that I thought it was the game. Nothing is happening in my home. I got up and checked outside. Right across the street, there was a man shoving a woman around the street and punching her while she was screaming. She pulls out her phone and he grabbed it and threw it across the road at my fence. He never saw me. He then runs around the corner and she goes the opposite way. I run out and catch her around the corner, and I try to help her out. She kept walking and blankly stared at me over her shoulder. I asked her if she had somewhere to go, and she didn't reply. I asked her if she needed help, and with that she replied with, Go away, in a shaky voice. I was going to turn back to my house when the man whips around the corner and starts screaming at me. He starts telling me that I'm getting into something that I don't need to be in, I got a weird feeling off that guy. He then puts his hand under his shirt and asks if I'm trying to get shot. I backed off and said, Hey, I'm sorry. Wasn't trying to get in someone's business. I just saw her crying and asked if she was okay, but I'll let you handle it. I walk past him to go back home, and he starts walking behind me. I started sprinting and sprinted all the way around the block, 
took the back entrance to the alley and went inside. I called the police, and five minutes later, five squad cars zoomed by my home. I'm not sure if they caught the guy or not. Hey everyone, before I begin, this has been reported to local police with as much detail as possible. I've been searching for several hours on who to reach out to, or how to put into words something I went through this evening. Tonight, my girlfriend and I were heading home from a picnic at a local park. As we drove away from the park and approached the stop sign, I noticed that there was a car parked at the stop sign. I remember thinking to myself that it seemed really odd. We pulled up to the car and stopped, and when I looked over, I saw a man, his wrists tied together, a terrifying expression on his face, as if he was screaming or crying for help. I froze and asked my girlfriend if she'd seen what I did, being as we pulled just forward from the car. She asked what I saw, turned around, and he was still there, wrists together on his steering wheel staring and making eye contact with her. We both panicked, asking, do we call 911? Do we circle back around? Trying to make sense of what we just saw, and I think it hit both of us at the same time, when we realized that it was most likely a tactic to lure us closer to his car. I know I've personally read multiple stories of possible trafficking tactics happening in my country, I'm lucky to have seen these and knew to get away as soon as I could. Sure enough, when we drove off, he followed us for about a half a mile, until we got to a busier road and lost him. I've been in a state of fear and confusion and panic ever since. It may seem like an overreaction, but I have, number one, never been in a fearful situation such as this, and number two, never seen someone tied up before in possible danger. I guess I'm looking for reassurance, wondering if anyone out there had been in the same or similar situation. I'm really shaken up by this, and I'm truly baffled that we live in a world where this happens. Stay safe, everyone. I got married too young and then divorced when I was 23. A few months went by and I started having these nightmares. Long story short, a girl in a white dress with brown hair matted with leaves and dirt walks into my house, tracking muddy footprints. She stops and stares at the attic stairs, which are down for some reason. I ask her why she's there. She screams and the whole house crumbles. I never saw her face. I had this nightmare almost every night for three months, and when I say almost every night, I mean probably 95% of the time. For some reason, I started sleeping in my living room as opposed to the bedroom. I just wasn't comfortable in there. So I'm sleeping on my couch one night and wake up at around 2am for no reason. I check my phone and see that I have a text from my friend and respond. I started getting very uncomfortable and then I heard a knock at my door. I walk around and peek out the window, and there's a girl there. I can't see anything other than her white hoodie, which is up, and long dark hair coming out of it. She knocks, and then knocks again, not urgently or anything, but she didn't appear intent on leaving. So, stupidly, I crack open the door. In a quiet voice, she asks if she can use my cell. I still can't really see her face because my porch light was out and I'd been putting off changing the light bulb for no reason at all. I ask if everything's okay, and she just repeats she needs to use the phone. Again, against my better judgment, I put my cell phone to the dial screen and hand it to her. I see her hit a few things and put the phone to her ear, and the screen light gave me a better view of her face. She was younger, somewhere between 18 to 22, plain, Nothing particularly distinguishing in any way. She waits for a minute, then says, Hey, I need your help. I need your help. Yeah, okay. Then hands me the phone. 
So I look at my phone, and it's still on the dial screen. Something felt weird to me, so I clicked over to the recent calls, and she hadn't called anyone. When I look up, she was gone. Not quite vanished, but like way, way down the street, farther than anyone should have been able to cover in that time frame, walking away. After that, the nightmare stopped. Potentially related, two months later I got a call from a friend late at night, who was like, Hey, you want to come over for a beer? I wasn't doing anything, so I did. I got back at about 1am, and my house had been broken into, totally trashed with a bunch of valuables gone. I certainly don't think my friend had anything to do with that, but I sometimes wonder if that girl was casing my house that night. It's the only correlation I can make between the dream stopping and real world explanations for that weird experience. The whole thing was just really weird. As a kid, I lived in the camper in the woods on my grandma's huge-ass property. I have no idea how much land she owned, but it was huge. Not the little kid version of, wow this is huge, but actually huge. My grandma had a farm, including cows. A storm shut down the power, which shut down the electric fence and a cow got out. So the next day, my teenage cousins come up to go find the cow and a little six-year-old me put on some snow boots and went with them. Again, this place is huge. We walked around for hours. Sometimes we would find what we thought might have been tracks, but they would just stop. Eventually we get to a part where none of us had ever been. We weren't allowed because it was a really unruly creek. You slip and you'd probably never be found. We were about to turn and give up when we saw a cow grazing. I was like, this isn't the cow we're looking for. How did this get here? We get closer, and this thing is wild, like borderline feral. It was not grazing on grass, but the cow we were looking for. Obviously, we booked it back to the house, thinking this cannibal cow was going to absolutely kill us. Like, they can't even do that, right? We tell my grandma what we found, and we thought she'd call us crazy, but her and my cousin's dad said, was it almost completely black? Yes, it was hard to tell because it was filthy, but I think so. Turns out there was a storm a couple of years ago where a cow got out and they never found it. They assumed something got in the woods and ate it. They figured that's what happened to this cow too, but they let us go looking anyways for funsies. Well, it was getting eaten in the woods by the other cow. They went to try and find it and the dead cow. They found the carcass. The cow had been struck by lightning and was dead before the cannibal cow ate it. And it didn't eat much of it at all, but to us kids, it looked like a lot. Anyways, that's the first time I saw a dead cow, and the first and only time I saw a cow eating another one. I have no idea what happened to the cannibal cow. Oh, also... On the same property, five people were murdered. Also, that's not the first time an animal got hit by lightning. My grandma had a blind pony that was blinded because it was hit by lightning. Mostly blind anyways. I think it could kind of see still. It died years later due to age and going deaf. It fell down a hill and died. The summer of 2008 was a rough time to graduate from college. I just spent four years getting a degree, only to find out that the job market had all but dried up. As bummed out as I was about being unemployed for the foreseeable future, I found a deep appreciation for backcountry camping and hiking that summer. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains and graduating from a college in western Montana, I was not a stranger to hiking or camping. But that summer, it became an escape to the point of an obsession. Going on daily hikes and camping beneath the stars really helped my mental health while I worried about my life's purpose and my future. It was June and unseasonably cold, wet, and cloudy. 
The daytime highs barely touched 50 degrees, and at night, it dropped below freezing. Despite the weather, I had planned to hike around the Anaconda Range that week, and I wasn't going to let that deter me. My plan for the week, funnily enough, was hike from Storm Lake over Storm Lake Pass and down to Upper Seymour Lake. Storm Lake is a challenge to get to and requires a 4x4 pickup and some driving skills. The road is a narrow two-track, winding its way through thick pine forests. The way was slick with rain, but I made it to the top with little heartburn. I set up camp on the north shore of the lake and decided to do some fishing. The fishing was miserable. It was cold and nothing was biting. The best thing about bad fishing is that my thoughts were free to wander while I sat on the shore. The rain was a constant light drizzle and created a natural white noise. Time passed, and my daydreams were cut short as a low rumble from up the canyon overtook the sound of the rain. The rumbling was not unlike a distant diesel engine. There are no roads that go beyond where I was camped. No machinery or vehicles could be up that canyon. Maybe it's a plane, I thought, looking up into the rain clouds. But the sound wasn't getting closer or farther away, and the sound wasn't above me. It came from beyond the lake and up into the canyon. The sound was stationary and constant. This was most certainly not a plane or a truck or a bulldozer. All of this wasn't outright scary, but nonetheless, my hair stood on end while I sat there listening. After twenty minutes, the rumbling faded away and I was left again with only the sound of raindrops. Soon enough, I caught a decent-sized trout, cleaned it, and headed back to camp to get ready for dinner. The fish cooked up fine, but to be honest, I hate trout. It's edible, sure, but totally unappetizing. They taste like mud. I ate as much as I could stand and tossed the rest into the lake. Building up my fire for the night, I sat back to enjoy the evening with a bit of whiskey. Night came fast. The mountain ridges put the sun to bed early, and the rain clouds obscured the starlight. It was dark, really dark. The sounds of crackling warm fire and the rain bouncing off my tent were a great comfort, and it was starting to lull me to sleep. I reminded myself I needed to build up the fire before bed. I walked over to my pile of scavenged firewood and grabbed an armful. It was growing louder than before, and closer. I may have had a few too many pulls of whiskey and was tired and grouchy. This noise was ruining my camping trip and my buzz. Frustrated, I yelled into the blackness of the night, Hey, shut the fuck up, asshole. Like a switch being flipped, the rumbling stopped, and so did the rain. My heart skipped a beat. I realized that was not a convenient coincidence. There was an intelligence out there, something sentient, observing me and responding to my screams, and I wasn't getting the most positive vibes from it. I threw all the logs on the fire and retreated back to my tent. More on edge than ever, I just sat there, listening, listening to the fire crackling, to my rapid breathing, and beyond that, to the silence of the darkness. Before this moment, I had felt alone but safe. Now I felt alone and vulnerable. Beyond where the light faded, I felt there were a million eyes in the dark watching me. My paranoia began to subside when the rain suddenly started again. Not a drizzle, but a massive downpour. I was glad I'd built up the fire, or it would have been snuffed out for sure. My tent was being pushed down by the force of the storm. I thought about bailing to the truck, but I knew I'd be soaked to the bone instantly. Risking injury or death over getting wet is the kind of logic only whiskey can produce. I could feel the rainwater pooling and moving under my tent. This storm wasn't letting up. The urge to get in the pickup and drive away was even more tantalizing. I could get my stuff tomorrow in the daylight and spend a few nights in town, but I'd had a bit too much to drink. Driving, especially on that slick, muddy two-track road, would have been a death sentence, but I still needed a safer place to sleep than my wimpy tent. Grabbing what I could, 
I ripped open the tent flaps and ran for the truck. I was soaking wet by the time I settled into the driver's seat and locked the doors. Turning the heat on full blast, I hoped that would dry me out. It was going to be a miserable night though. I reclined my chair and tried to calm my thoughts with deep breaths. The rain wasn't letting up. I was warm from the heater and I was riding the crest of a good whiskey buzz. The fire was still raging despite the rain and kept the campsite well lit. I remember the truck's clock reading 1.06am. I blinked. It was only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the rain had stopped. It was foggy and quiet. The once raging campfire was just embers and there was morning twilight to the east. The truck's clock now read 5.45am. It was morning. That couldn't be right. Almost five hours gone in the blink of an eye. I must have passed out. My head was killing me. I didn't feel like I drank that much to justify that kind of hangover. I turned off the truck and stepped out to survey the night's damage. My tent was completely flattened. The tent pulse was shattered to pieces. Everything was soaking wet. Smothering the remains of the fire, I dragged all my junk to the pickup and tossed it into the bed. My hike over the pass wasn't going to happen, that was for sure. It was around 6.30 a.m. before I finished packing up my camp. As I climbed into the cabin of my truck, I heard the rumbling again through the morning fog. I drove out of there as fast as I could down that muddy bobsled track of a road, not once looking in the rearview mirror once. I have never been back to Storm Lake. I probably never will. So, before I get into this, I need to throw a disclaimer out there that I was 18 years old when this event took place. I've never done hard drugs in my life, I don't drink alcohol, and I started smoking weed when I was 22. Also, there were three other teenagers with me that night who were also sober and witnessed this as well. So, my friend and I were hanging out with two of her guy friends Friday night after school and the plans were that we were having a sleepover at my friend's house. We were just hanging around town, nothing much to do in a small Georgia town but walk around the town square and go to the trails. Well, after shooting the shit for a couple of hours, we got hungry and ordered a pizza for pickup. We got the pizza and drove to a pretty quiet neighborhood where one of the guys lived. The neighborhood was kind of tucked away into a forest, so it was really quiet and really dark in that area of town. As we were sitting there outside, eating pizza, using the hood of the car as a makeshift table, I looked up and saw what looked like a large, pitch-black mass that resembled a primate in shape and movement, swinging high in the trees that had to be a good 800 feet away from us. Even from that distance in the night, it looked so huge. But that made no sense as we live in a small town in Georgia. There are no large primates here. I alerted everyone to this figure in the trees, and we were all baffled and amazed at what we were seeing. I remember just having the sense of dread washing over me as I looked at this figure, trying to make sense of what I'm seeing. Then, it seemed like it noticed us. We couldn't see any distinct features, and the figure was pitch black, but somehow, you just knew it was watching you. Suddenly, this shadowy black figure stood tall, and you could almost see it shifting before your eyes, as it began to resemble more closely the shape of a large man, holding onto a branch with one arm, just staring at us with unseen eyes. Everyone was frozen, so still and so quiet. It seemed like the sounds of the night froze in place with us. We were just transfixed on this dark figure in the trees, then, this creature crouched over, and as it did, its shoulders seemed to stretch impossibly higher, reaching over its head. All of us were in shock and terrified at seeing this, maybe a little in denial as what we were seeing was defying any logical explanation, because you want this to make sense. And then, 
this creature's shoulders, for lack of a better word or better way to explain this, seemed to just grow into these huge wings. Then this dark figure jumped off the branch and flew off. I knew what I was seeing was real, because when that happened, we all ran into the car without talking, just screaming as fast as possible, and we sped away from there. We were all freaking out, trying to find any logical reason that could explain what we had just witnessed, but there was none. Needless to say, no one slept that night. We were all too terrified that maybe that thing would follow us back to my friend's house. I should also mention that this was back in 2010, so there were no good camera phones to capture whatever we saw back then. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He had tons of old cowboy stories he would tell us grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from nearby farms, decided to go ice skating for the day. At that time, my great-grandpa was working as a ranch hand, and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902, and though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portneuf River to ice skate. There were eight kids altogether, and they were excited to show off their new skates for Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were three Robinson kids, Tommy Bayer and Gooch twins. The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker, and if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating when a loud scream came from a willow bush on the riverbank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They fled towards the sleighs, trying to scramble up the riverbank in their skates. My grandpa, being the youngest, was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a foothold because of the skates and fell backwards towards the ice. The giant was now crossing the river towards them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river, because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged its shins, but was slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the riverbank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, this giant man was cresting the riverbank. To their utter relief, it didn't chase the sleighs. It just stood there hollering at the kids and swinging his tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch, where they told their encounter to John Gooch, the twins' grandfather. Word quickly spread in the tiny farming community and soon a posse was formed to hunt down the beast. Where the kids had been skating, there were footprints found almost two feet in length. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The posse followed them as far as they could, but deep snow prevented their travel any farther. The creature was never sighted in that area again. This story captivated the small community, and soon word traveled across the country of the Idaho Wild Man. That spring, my grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the Little Lost River Valley farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwoods stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure he would have been killed if that giant hadn't broken through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces.
Right around high school graduation, I was sitting in the living room at 1 or 2 a.m. when I saw headlights and heard a thud. I cracked the front door and there was a car outside. It appeared as though they might have hit my truck. As I started to open the door, they sped off. I checked the truck the following morning, but nothing looked obviously damaged. I went to work at my cashier job and my co-workers were talking about an armed robbery and a taxi driver that was killed with a handgun overnight. Pretty scary, I thought. About a month later, one of my mom's friends who happened to work for the county asked me to look at my truck very closely and call her if I found anything. I told her later that after closer inspection, yes, there was a small crack to the plastic rim around the driver's side taillight and I told her about the car that probably did it. She explained to me that the detectives had arrested a group of teenagers while investigating the cabbie murder, and that during the interviews, they mentioned stealing a car and bumping into a truck while joyriding, before robbing a gas station at gunpoint and ending the life of a taxi driver. About two weeks ago, my wife and I had some friends over, and someone mentioned a Facebook story about a cabbie getting robbed at gunpoint. Someone else mentioned the murder, so I shared my story. My wife then added that we both could have died that night because she was the gas station clerk that got robbed. I knew that something bad had happened to her around that time and that she never talks about it much. It's such a scary and odd coincidence to me that before we were even together, we were in the path of that same violent crime spree. This didn't happen to me, but to my parents. My mom going off the deep end on a crazy train isn't that out of character, but my dad doesn't do that ever, and he swears the story is legit. When I was around two-ish, my mom woke up from a nightmare and she woke my dad up. He tried going back to sleep, and she told him not to, because his mom was going to call soon. She was going to tell him that someone they knew had been decapitated in some kind of fashion. My dad, of course, thought this was nonsense, but my mom was hysterical over it, so he couldn't sleep. Sure enough, a few minutes later, the phone was ringing. It was his mom letting him know that his friend and his friend's little brother's girlfriend had both died in a car crash, coming home from a party about three miles away from us. My dad's mom and their family were very close, and my grandma and the mother from that family were lifelong friends and died just six months or so apart. Anyway, I later learned that my dad's friend had been decapitated when he lost control in his ragtop Camaro. He hit a tree, flipped the car upside down, and slid a ways down the road. Neither he nor his younger brother's girlfriend were wearing seatbelts. This would have been back in maybe 1981-ish. I worked as a maintenance guy, which means at times I gotta be there at odd hours to perform inspections with fire guys. I had a property that was about 60 miles away and needed a fire alarm to go off at 5am prior to tenant arrival. It's the day before, about 5pm. I take my car on the street in front of my house. The weather had recently shifted tempos so all my tires were reading warning. It's a dual exhaust car and it's running so I can use this piece of shit compressor. Think like cheap Walmart cigarette lighter air pump. It struggles to add 5 PSI. It's taking time. There's a light breeze, but it's only helping to push my car exhaust into my face. This whole time I'm near the pump and tire being inflated, so I spend a lot of time crouched or sat on the curb. I take this time to reiterate that this entire time, I said I was about 20 minutes, but I don't know for sure time got wonky. My car is running and I can smell the exhaust. It stinks but I'm outside. The tires after an eternity are good. I'm ready for my journey in the morning. I'll be leaving at 4am. I set my alarm for 3. I finished the night. It was unremarkable. I conversed with my wife. 
I got pity for having to wake up stupid early. The usual. So, I've already fucked up. As now in the story, nobody has a clue that I'm walking dead. The alarm goes off at 3am. I fumble with it, stopping it. And in my attempt to get out of bed, I flat out fell, crushing a hamper. While I'm on the floor, my wife wakes to that noise and all she hears is, Ow. And then I get up and stumble to the bathroom. She laughed off my stupidity and went back to sleep. I took a shower and I felt like I was drunk as shit. Must just be tired, I think. I'll shake it off when I start getting going. My memory of all of this gets spotty, so I'm using what I was told as well just for context. I got in the car, backed out the driveway, ran over a trash can. I think, shit, I must not be okay. I pulled back into the garage, closed the door, car off and all that. The trash can out in the street is on its side. I go inside to bed, lay down, and I'm out like a light. My wife assumed that I called in sick when I came back in. Surmised from the fall out of bed thing, I wasn't having a great morning. So a couple of hours go by, she wakes up and leaves for work. I'm still just out. I've worked at this place now for about five years. I have a strong working relationship with my co-workers. We all know each other's spouses and kids' names. I get a text that somehow wakes me from my sleep, and I manage to respond via text to my property manager. She read it and was calling me immediately. I wish I still had the text, but it was basically gibberish with autocorrect lending a hand, and she knew something was off. So she called me. I picked up and we spoke for a second or two, and then she hung up on me. So I'm like, She's mad or something, whatever. Back to sleep I go. I just really wanted to sleep. But now it's probably around 9am. My wife comes back home and tries to wake me up. It's not effective. I got really spotty here, but she basically helped me to the car and I remember her fucking slamming gears. We both drove manuals and she was hammered down. I was calm, I just wanted to keep sleeping. So tired. So fucking tired. We got to the ER. No wait for this guy. Straight to a room, oxygen covering my face. IV in. They kept telling me I need to stay awake, but sleep was right there. I dozed off so many times. I was being scolded by the doctors. I remember being confused. Like, what did I do, bro? Stop talking down to me. I'm just trying to take a little nap. I'm not sure exactly how severe it was, but based on the look on their faces, it didn't seem like a sure thing I'd be leaving out the same doors I came in. I remember being concerned and so tired. So very tired. This entire experience carves a gigantic black spot in my memory. I've had to piece it together from broken memory and accounts from my wife. I know had I not been taken to the hospital, I'd still be sleeping. I have my property manager to thank for calling my wife. She would have been gone for another five to six hours that day. I know I would have been in the bed still, with the broken hamper still under my side. If you made it here, use this account as a warning. Be aware. People said relatives will have the car on in the garage with open doors. To me, now. It's not worth it. If you smell exhaust, you need to shift position, unwind, move. This wasn't a rapid progression. I was coherent after the damage was done, while my body was still replacing oxygen with poison, suffocating myself from the inside. Be safe out here in this crazy place, strangers. I went on a vacation with my family. We stayed in a hotel slash resort right next to the beach. Every night, my family and me went for a drink or an evening stroll on the promenade. The promenade itself was also filled with a lot of people, especially couples enjoying a beautiful evening walk. On the third day, I couldn't sleep. 
My brother was still awake, but we had a fight earlier, so I didn't ask him to come on my walk. Now, before you think I was being stupid, it was midnight I think, and still the promenade was filled with people, so I put on some loose pants and a shirt, nothing fancy, and I went on a walk. Normally I'm quite aware of my surroundings, especially at night, but since there was a lot of people around, I put in my earphones and listened to some relaxing music. The walk started off great. I was watching the beautiful nightlife on the promenade and the other resorts. After 30 minutes, I went to sit on a bench to tie my shoelaces. In the corner of my eye, I noticed a man stopping and sitting on the second bench away from me. I didn't find it suspicious yet. I got up and started to walk again and I noticed that the man got up too and was walking about 20 meters behind me. I slowed down my pace and put my earphones in my pocket. I was getting suspicious, but I wanted to know for sure. Again, I stopped and pretended to search for something on my phone. He stopped as well. The problem with the promenade, it is a long line, so I had to pass the creepy man to get back to my hotel. Since I was still surrounded by people, I felt somewhat safe. In my head, I had the most genius plan to go down to the beach and hide behind one of the beach chairs. The beach was pitch black, and in my mind, this was the best solution. I started to speed up. The creepy man didn't match my pace yet. Then a big group of people passed by, and I made a run to the beach and hid. Thirty seconds later, I saw him looking from the promenade in my direction. He was searching for me. I was hoping he'd give up, but he started making his way towards the beach chairs. That moment, I didn't think, and started running on the beach. Once I was far enough, I went back on the promenade and sprinted. Completely soaked in sweat, I stopped in front of my hotel and looked back. I had lost the creepy man. I had rushed back to my room. That was the one and only time I went walking alone. I know I should have asked for help from people around me, so just because you're surrounded by people, don't think you're safe. This happened to me last summer, and it still gives me chills to think about. That day, I went to the thrift store with my boyfriend, and as we were heading back home, I suggested we pick up some sushi for dinner at our nearby grocery store. As my boyfriend works night shifts, he was already feeling tired and suggested that I go to the store while he goes back home. We live in the busy part of our city, where the mall, library, city hall, restaurants, major stores, and everything else are all a couple of minutes away from our home. Not to mention, I live in a relatively safe city with little crime, so I was more than alright with going by myself. Now, I truly wish I hadn't. As we parted ways, I was walking through the parking lot of the grocery store, when a stocky man, about 6 foot 5, probably in his early to mid 40s, approached me. With a white smile and wider eyes, he said, Wow, you are stunning. I simply thanked him and tried walking away. He cut me off, saying, I've never seen someone as beautiful as you before. I was immediately filled with dread. I looked back, hoping my boyfriend was still in sight. No luck. It may seem like an exaggeration to be wary of a person right off the bat, but having read and watched true crime and horror stories for years, Coupled with having extreme social anxiety and being a smaller woman with zero fighting skills, I have always sided with caution. Not to mention with his eyes and smile, he honestly reminded me of a buffer Art the Clown from Terrifier, minus the clown costume and lack of talking. The man roped me into a one-sided conversation, asking me my name and how old I was. I gave him a fake name. I told him I was 19. He laughed and said unnaturally excitedly, That's good. That means you're a true woman now. What the actual fuck? My boyfriend later told me I should have lied and said I was under 18, 
as this may have made the man uninterested. From the red flags I got from this man, I seriously doubt that. He then stuck his phone out, asking for my number. I refused, saying I had a boyfriend. And I just want to talk to you, he said. I repeated that I had a boyfriend. It was unnerving how his smile never wavered, despite showing that I wasn't interested. It was like he wasn't understanding, or he just didn't care. He sounded confused, but still grinning. He stepped towards me and asked, So you don't want to cheat on your boyfriend? As if to say, What do you mean you don't want to go out with a scary-ass man that's double your age? Speechless, I stepped back and gave pleading looks to the people walking in and out of the grocery store. After the last time I refused, his smile suddenly dropped. Well, he placed his hand on my back, saying in a now cold, firm tone, Come on, I have a nice car I can drive you around in. Let's check out one of these restaurants. Seeing a person's entire demeanor change with a flip of a switch was something I only saw in the movies or on TV shows. And seeing it in this situation fucking terrified me. Going into panic mode, I somehow found the courage to push myself off of him and almost shouted, Sorry, I really have to go buy my groceries. Noticing that people were staring at us, his sick smile reappeared and said with a low voice, All right then, I'll see you later. I practically ran into the store with so much relief. I glanced back, hoping to see him get into his car and try getting his license plate number, only to see the man just standing in the middle of the parking lot, leering at me. Shit. I called my boyfriend in the store, but it kept going to voicemail. I figured he was sleeping, and I was seriously scared to walk back home. I managed to calm myself down in the store, figuring the man must be long gone. Yet I was on high alert the entire walk home. It was starting to get dark, but I figured if I just stayed cautious and walked quickly, I would be fine. I couldn't be more wrong. When I was approaching the crosswalk that led to my street, I heard a car pulling up to the sidewalk, followed by a sickeningly familiar voice barking. Hey. Hi. Hey. Hi. My heart dropped into my stomach. I glanced sideways at the car, with his unmistakably now malicious looking grin plastered on his face. The man's upper body was leering out of his car window as if he was trying to reach out to me. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. He tauntingly called out, So where's your boyfriend? While cackling. From everything I've learned from true crime and horror stories, I figured it was best to not acknowledge the man. My mind racing while trying to appear composed, I knew I couldn't lead him to my house, and turning back to go to the mall or stores, may have given away that I was terrified and trying to escape. Bless whoever designed my neighborhood, as the city's rec center was conveniently right next to my complex. I ignored him and casually crossed the street, quickening my pace as I headed into the rec center. I tried not to look back, scared that I would see the man running up on me with his wide grin. But I made it into the rec center and finally looked behind me, I assumed the man would have followed me in, or waited for me in his car. Instead, he sped away down a street opposite from my house. With so much relief, I called my boyfriend, who woke up to my call. I was on the verge of breaking down, but managed to fill him in on everything. He rushed to the rec center, and after he calmed me down, we walked home. My boyfriend asked if I got the man's license plate number to which I felt like a fucking idiot. Not only was it too dark, but I was too consumed with fear for my own life that it didn't even cross my mind at the time. At the very least, I called the police, giving them a description of the man and the make and model of his car. They said they would do what they could, but I haven't heard back from them. I haven't seen the man since, not in person at least, but I still see that man's smile in my dreams haunting me for countless nights, plaguing my mind. Thinking about every sadistic, glaring look he had in his car, 
reminds me that he was overjoyed to realize that I was alone and vulnerable, that my seemingly safe city isn't as safe as I thought. At the same time, I felt so grateful that the man never found out where I lived, but for all I know, he could be lurking around, trying to harm other women like he tried to that night he almost trailed me home. For mine and the women in my city's sake, I hope I don't have to find out. While still in the depths of Arctic winter, with the equinox approaching the day slash night cycle becoming more even, my flight to the slope was delayed due to a large blizzard which shut down the dead horse and Caparook airstrips. I spent three days waiting in Anchorage until the storm cleared and we were able to fly. Landing at the Caparook airstrip, it was evident the blizzard was more severe than we had initially thought. While whiteout blizzards are common, actual snow accumulation is not. This storm, though, was a monster. Snowdrifts several stories tall ran up against the camp housing. Our work trucks and equipment were completely covered in snow, and it took a full day of digging to get them out. As soon as the trucks were free, we were off to our first job assignment. No time to rest in the oil field. Traveling anywhere after a storm this size is a nightmare. To get to the work site, we had a bulldozer escort us breaking up any remaining drifts as we went. The dozer cleared our work area around the well house and we began to rig up our equipment. It took little time and soon we were back to the normal humdrum life of arctic oil well maintenance. Over the radio, we got a call from the bulldozer operator as he left that he'd seen a giant black animal headed in our direction. He couldn't tell if it was a wolf or a big dog, but it was massive and moving erratically. In the winter, many animals aren't active on the slope. Caribou, musk oxen, and foxes are the usual wildlife you'll encounter out in the snow. The animals keep to themselves for the most part, but you learn very quickly to never look the animals in the eyes if they approach you. This goes doubly for the white foxes, and I advise you to do the same. The grizzlies are hibernating, male polar bears are hunting on the sea ice while the females are denned up with new cubs. Wolves aren't unheard of, but rarely leave the Brooks Range Mountains a couple hundred miles to the south. Whatever the operators saw, we would keep watch, but it wasn't our problem. It was a problem for the bear police. We went about our work, albeit cautiously. It's interesting to note that oil companies on the slope have private security officers who, besides being private law enforcement, also try to minimize encounters with wildlife. We refer to them as the Bear Police, which is a cute name for a rather dangerous part of their job. These security officers are the only personnel on the North Slope that carry firearms, outside of regular law enforcement, of course. Their primary job when encountering large predators is to harass them until they leave. This is done with beanbag guns or loud noises at first. When that fails, or the animal is unusually aggressive, lethal force is needed. We had settled into our work and forgot about the wolf or dog or whatever it was. I needed to take a leak. I got out of the truck and walked behind the well house to take care of business. My crewmate came over the radio telling me to get back into the truck. There was a wolf coming out from behind the well house where I'd just been and he was pacing after me. I didn't look behind me, I just ran back and jumped into the truck. I'm not taking my chances, even if it was a crewmate practical joke. Once inside, I looked out, and sure enough, trotting towards the truck was a large, black, male wolf. He approached our trucks and sat down in the snow in front of us. This wolf looked rough, even by wild animal standards. The right side of his face was mutilated and deformed, missing his right eye and most of his skin and lips on that side of his head. The wound exposed large white teeth, giving him the appearance of a wide, crooked smile. He didn't appear aggressive, but he didn't take his good eye off us. That one good eye was bright red in appearance. It was eerie. 
The way he sat there, staring, watching, waiting. We radioed the security officers for help, and like a speeding bullet, they showed up 40 minutes later. That whole time waiting there, the wolf never diverted his attention from us. If I hadn't seen him breathing, I would have assumed it was a statue. The security officers arrived and took some pictures for their reports. Then they began the process of driving the animal back out into the tundra. Truck horns didn't startle him. He didn't even flinch. Charging him with their truck did nothing either. They took aim with their beanbag gun and hit him square in the ribs. The wolf let out a yelp, but didn't get up or move from his spot. The next beanbag hit him in the head, and that jolted him enough to get up and leave. Security told us to call back if we saw the wolf again. They seemed confident he would move on and not be a bother anymore. The sun was setting, and our job was still hours from wrapping up. Working a 13 to 15 hour day isn't unusual. You either get used to the long hours, or you find another line of work pretty quick. I was running the computer equipment inside the truck, and weird data was coming back from the tools down in the well. They were blanking out and losing signal, or they were reporting data backwards. But diagnostics wasn't indicating any issues. To the computer systems, everything was operating normally. I tried a few different things to fix the issue, but it persisted. One of the workers went out to the wellhead to check the gauges and cables, trying to isolate the problem from there. He was outside for not more than five minutes, before the night was pierced by a long, bellowing howl. This was immediately followed by the high-pitched shriek of our crewmate. Throwing the door open, I was able to catch a fleeting glimpse of a large, dark figure running behind the wellhouse. Our crewmate ran past us and jumped inside, pale, sweating, and full of adrenaline. He tried to relate what just happened. Through his panting, he said he was in the wellhouse checking the cables when someone walked up behind him. Thinking it was one of us, he started a conversation with his back turned. When he got no reply, he turned and was met face to face with a seven foot tall black wolf standing on his hind legs. It stood between him and the door, growling. Without thinking, he flung his pipe wrench at the beast and struck him hard in the chest. That's when it let out a howl and ran off. Our crewmate was adamant that it was the same wolf from earlier because its face was mangled in that crooked half smile and one fiery red eye. Myself and the others on the crew had a hard time believing he saw a giant wolf man. We had no doubt he saw the wolf, but we reasoned that in his panic, he hallucinated that it was upright like a man. But we'd all encountered enough weird things on the slope to never count out the impossible. We radioed the security officers and told them the wolf had returned and waited inside the truck. What else could we do but wait? I wasn't about to go there and fight Satan's guard dog with a clipboard and mouse pad. Every time we felt like things settled down outside, we would hear a growl or something would push against the truck. Periodically, we could see something pacing in the dark just beyond the reach of the work lights. Even though we were inside a locked truck cabin, it was still a very vulnerable feeling. We were very much trapped. I'm sure it felt similar to what divers experience inside a shark cage far out at sea. All of this went on for an hour while we waited for someone to show up. Finally, coming up the road we could see headlights of three approaching vehicles. The security team had showed up, this time with actual rifles. Over the radio we told them what had been going on. You could feel their disbelief and eyes rolling through the radio. The sass and disbelief soon faded when we explored the work site and found it covered in fresh, large wolf tracks. The security team split up with two trucks headed out to search for the wolf while the last one remained with us as we loaded our equipment and finished our job. We didn't hear or see anything else that night as we cleaned up, but we sure did keep our heads on a swivel. The security officers didn't find the wolf that night. A set of tracks left off the work site and out into the open tundra. The officers commented that the tracks looked weird. 
This was due to them only seeing the back paw prints in the snow. The last security truck escorted us back to the main camp, while the others continued their search into the night. For the following week, various reports came in across the oil field of people seeing this mangled black wolf during the day. And at night, reports kept coming in of a black beast walking upright and harassing or cornering workers. Security seemed to always show up minutes too late. During this time frame, many of the Alaskan native workers were getting nervous. One of our friends in the camp workshop was from Nuiksut, a small Inupiat village just west of the oil field. He told us it sounded exactly like a Hijirak, a shape-shifting creature that can take the form of any arctic animal while it hunts. He said it was obvious as the wolf was a normal animal in the daylight, but transformed into an upright monster after nightfall. The Ijirak are thought to be Inuit hunters that traveled too far north and became stuck between the world of the living and the dead. They transformed into evil, deformed men with sideways mouths and eyes. They used their power of shapeshifting to hunt other Inuit, especially children. The Inupiat are very wary of wild animals for this very reason. A week following our encounter, the security team was able to corner the wolf on a remote work site. It had attacked and trapped two welders in their truck. Both workers had superficial cuts through their snowsuits, but were otherwise fine. Having no other choice, the wolf was euthanized on the spot. Security shot the wolf once, and instead of dropping dead, it charged the officer that shot it. The wolf took three more high-powered rifle shots before it eventually collapsed at the feet of the officer. Even then, paralyzed in the now crimson snow, the wolf was still growling through its crooked, wide smile. After several minutes, it had finally succumbed to its wounds. The wolf's body was taken to the University of Alaska Fairbanks for dissection and examination. Outside of the facial deformities and gnarled appearance, the biologist concluded it was an ordinary wolf from the Brooks Range Mountains. How it got hundreds of miles from home, and why it stayed on the tundra, is a complete mystery. This happened back in 2016 on Christmas Eve night. We'd just gotten back from my sister's and we were sitting in the car for a few. It was fairly cold. Also, side note, we had a bunch of cats, so at first we hadn't thought anything of it. We sat there for about 10 minutes and we heard rustling. Not thinking anything about it because of the cats, we blew it off. Not even a minute later, we heard it again. My mom just so happened to look up and there was a bald man in a wife-beater tank top and shorts. My mom and I both had that uneasy feeling because of his choice of clothing. It was 32 degrees and he's in summer clothes. Weird. My mom has her window cracked and he was barely a foot from our car. My mom yelled out to him and said to back away from our car, which surprise he didn't. He continued to stand there and stare at us. My mom decided to try and scare him. She yelled out to him that she had a gun and would blow his shit away. She didn't have a gun on her, but she definitely made sure he thought she did. He threw his hands up, but continued to get closer to our car, so my mom threw her phone at me and I was told to dial 911. I told the dispatcher what was going on, and she said she'd have the police there right away. My mother proceeded to try and run him down, because he went between two porches but our car wouldn't fit because of how close the porches were to each other. Finally, after half a fucking hour later, the cops finally showed up and took our statements. The station was literally right down the road from us, and if he had actually tried something, I felt as if it would have been too late. If he hadn't run, I wouldn't have thought he had ill intentions, but he ran, so I was very pissed off that it took so long for the cops to show up. The cops stayed and looked everywhere for him, but came up empty. My mom nor I slept that night or finished opening presents because of fear that he would come back. The police thought that maybe he wanted to steal the gifts that were in the car, 
but we may never know. The scariest part is, months later it came to light that he'd escaped jail. He was put in for assault, so who knows what he would have done to me and my mom. Around 2006-ish, I was driving flatbed, picked up a load of construction material in rural Tennessee. My memory is foggy now, but I want to say between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersection of the Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee state lines. A tarp was required, so I strapped everything down, tarped the load, and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere, in woods on a second lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a white shoulder and pulled over to fix it. I realized that I flat just did a shitty job tarping this load and decided to redo it on the side of the road. I undo all the bungee straps, drag the tarps off, roll them back up, climb up on the ladder and start unrolling the tarps again. And I see a guy walking down the same side of the road I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than to keep an eye on him because I'm in the middle of nowhere and I continue what I'm doing. About the time I have the tarp set in place and I'm climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, this guy's getting close enough that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working, just in case. The guy gets to me, and the first thing I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but it's patchy as hell. It was like he tried to cut his own hair and had a seizure in the process, and said, fuck it, good enough to party. The next thing I notice were his eyes, which I can only describe as off, like they were clear. I didn't think he was drunk or high or anything, but it also gave me the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, and with dirty white tennis shoes. I remember he didn't have any laces on one shoe, and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits till I acknowledge him, and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, yeah man, you do. We're in the middle of nowhere. Making it clear there's no right to be had here. He nods. Starts walking by me, continuing on his way. Stops at about the driver door on my truck and turns around. He comes back to me and repeats himself. I've got a long walk. At this point, I explain to him that I can't give him a ride, insurance and all that. I apologize for not being able to help him out, and he seems to accept this, turns around and leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from my truck and start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on him, and he's moving away from me. As I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps, I look over to check where he's at and he's turned around, heading back towards me, now about a hundred yards in front of my truck and coming back my way. It looks like he's talking on a cell phone. He has his hand up to his face, and I can barely make out his moving mouth, his other hand waving like he's having a conversation with someone. I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and I'm climbing into my truck as he's about ten yards away now. As soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors. I set the winch bar on the passenger seat, just in case. I look at the guy and realize he's not talking on a phone. He's talking to his hand. And now I'm nervous, because he doesn't look like he's having a nice, pleasant chat. It looks more like an angry conversation. I crank the truck up, put it into gear, and just pull out. I didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with this dead-ass look on it, just staring at me. 
It gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth or sixth gear, I look in the mirror, and there's no one there. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me. Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, Pie Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoed, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.